good morning again. If you've got your Bibles, you want to open up to the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. It's where we are going to start today. And today we're going to be talking about doubt. Now, before we do that, um, I just want to acknowledge that I understand and get not all doubt is bad, okay? Um, sometimes doubt can actually help us. Sometimes doubt can protect us. Sometimes doubt can save us. Um, for example, I'll give you an example of when doubt can be good. If I see a rattlesnake right there in front of me, and I say to myself, even though I saw a guy on YouTube do it, and even though I know my buddy Robert, who's here today, could do it, I doubt I have the skills to reach down there and catch that thing with my bare hand and survive. I mean, I could probably catch it, but I don't know if I would survive the encounter. That kind of doubt is actually a, probably a pretty good doubt, right? Like if, if I were to say, you know, that's going to help me to doubt that I have that kind of skill. Or, or let's say um, I come across a, a real big, large, deep hole or ditch that I need to, to get over. And I, I look at that hole, I look at that ditch, and I say to myself, you handsome fella. <laughs> That's how I like to start my conversations with myself. You handsome fella. I know at one point you were athletic enough to jump over this ditch. But I doubt, with as athletic as you still are, I doubt today you can make it. That's probably a good kind of doubt, right? That kind of doubt would save me a trip to the hospital <laughs> or or some kind of injury, perhaps. So not all doubt is bad. Not all doubt is dangerous. But that's not really the kind of doubt we're going to talk about today. Today we're, we're talking about a collision between our faith and doubt. And we've all had a, a bout with doubt. We've all had a time in our life where there was something that came along that, that we doubted. And it was... It was not good that we doubted it. Well, let me just ask you the question. This isn't a trick question. This isn't a, a question that's going to, you know, lead to a, a trick question or anything. But how many of you have said these, these three little words? How many of you have ever said, I doubt it? How many of you have ever said that? You're, we've all doubted something. Or maybe you've said something similar to it, like, well, I'll believe it when I see it. That, that's another common way we can express our doubt in something. When we are saying those kinds of words, or when we doubt something, what we're basically saying is we're skeptical, we're uncertain, we're suspicious about someone or about something. We're, we're challenging the authenticity of the claim or the statement that has been made. It shows that we don't have faith in that something or that someone or whatever it is we said, I doubt it, or I'll believe it when I see it about. And we've all had those. We've all had those bouts with doubt. I think, I think Lee Strobel maybe said it the best. He said there's three kinds of people when it comes to doubt. He said, number one, there are those who are struggling with doubt right now. And there's probably many in the room, many who can hear my voice right now, who are in that group of people struggling with doubt right now. He said, number two, there are those who have no doubts now, but we'll struggle with doubts at some point in the future. And then he said there's a third group of people. These are people who have no doubts at all and will never have any doubts because they're basically brain-dead people. <laughs> Which I think is a good way of saying it. We all have doubts. Like, you, how, There's no way to get through this world or this life without having a collision between faith and doubt. The Bible's full of doubters. You don't have to read it through it more than once to see a bunch of doubters in the pages of Scripture. Some, many of the people in the Bible had some form of doubt, some bout with doubt. Their life is not defined by their doubts, but there were times in each of their lives where doubt came into play. I'll just rattle off a few. Uh, Abraham and Sarah had doubts. She laughed at God. Moses had his doubts there at the burning bush. Gideon had doubts. Jonah obviously had some doubts. David, King David, had doubts. Elijah had doubts. John the Baptist had doubts. Peter, the apostle, 
He had doubts. Philip had doubts. Read John 14. Nicodemus had doubts in John chapter 3. Jairus had doubts in Mark chapter 5. Like, All of these people and many, many more had doubts or a period of time in their life where there was a collision between their faith and doubt. And here's what I would submit to you today about these kinds of doubts, the dangerous kinds of doubts. The big idea is this, doubt is toxic. When doubt enters your life, this kind of doubt, the kind of doubt we're speaking of today, when that doubt enters your life, it's toxic. Those are just a few examples of people in Scripture that faced this collision. But we're going to look specifically today at a guy by the name of Thomas. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. You know, last time we were together, we were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We talked about the collision last week between life and death. Now, I want you to see what happens after Jesus is resurrected. You would think everything just gets smoothed out, everything is great, and everybody's happy, but the reality is there was a lot of doubt after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Can you all imagine that? People doubted that happened? Some of y'all are like, oh, I, I, what do you mean? Like, can, can you imagine how hard that would be to believe if somebody told you that had happened? And so obviously there are people, Thomas being one of them, who had their doubts. If you look at John chapter 20, starting in verse 24, it said, but Thomas, one of the 12, so he's one of the guys, y'all. He's one of the disciples, one of the 12. This isn't a random guy on the street. This isn't a a, a subscriber on YouTube. This, This is one of the 12. But he wasn't with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. They're giving him testimony. They've seen Jesus. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now a week goes by between verse 25 and 26. He is in this bout of doubt for an entire week. Verse 26 starts by saying a week later, His disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. He says, Don't be faithless, but believe. And Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. it's, It's truly unfortunate, church, that Thomas has become known for his doubt. The reality is this about Thomas. Thomas was a faithful disciple of Jesus. He was a faithful man of God. He was a man who was faithful to spread the gospel unashamedly and fearlessly until ultimately he was killed for preaching the gospel. Another important reality to realize as you read through this story before you're too hard on Tom, old Tommy here, like, he's not the only one who was facing doubt. He's not the only one who had his doubts about the resurrection. Really, the bigger point for today is that following the resurrection, many doubted. Mark says in Mark 16, 10 through 11, she went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping, and yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. They doubted it. In Luke 24, 9 through 11, it says it like this, returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to the rest, Mary and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things But look at verse 11. This is going to astound you. It says, But these words seem like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Can y'all believe they did not believe the women? I mean, that's almost harder to believe than that their words sounded like nonsense to them. They said they couldn't even believe it. What? He's risen from the dead? They, They can't even wrap their minds around it. And they did not believe them. They were skeptical. They were doubting it. 
Thomas is not, my point is this, Thomas is not the only one who had his doubts. Now Jesus eventually appears to the disciples, and that casts away all their doubts, but for some reason Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't present when Jesus first appeared, and so now he's famous for his bout with doubt for an entire week until he too had an encounter with Jesus. Now, it would be easy for us to dismiss the power of doubt. It would be easy for us to say, well, I believe. I believe Jesus is risen from the dead. I, I believe he's my Lord and Savior. I believe, so doubt doesn't affect me. But, but the reality is this, to dismiss the devastating effect of doubt in our life or to just pretend like it doesn't affect us is that if we do that, we're, we're just making ourselves more prone to be overcome with doubt and to experience the toxic effects of doubt and to give the devil more leverage and power in our life to use it against us. We need to be able to see and understand and recognize how dangerous doubt can be, and we need to be able to identify it and how it affects us and those around us. So what I want to do is I want to start with what I'm calling the four dangers of doubt. That's the first blank there in your outline. The four dangers of doubt. We're going to walk through them really quick. We're not going to have time to do an exhaustive study of scripture of each of them, but they're very practical. They make sense. You're going to see how these have worked in your own life. These aren't hard to understand, but I, I just want to give us uh, an opportunity to see how the devil uses these in our own doubts and why they're so dangerous and why they're so toxic. And then at the end, we're going to talk about some detoxers for doubt, but let's start with the dangers of it, okay? The first major danger of doubt is this. Doubt is destabilizing. Doubt destabilizes everything it touches. When you doubt your spouse, or when you give your spouse a reason to doubt you, that destabilizes your marriage. When you doubt a friend, or a coworker, or a colleague, that is going to destabilize that relationship to some degree. Now, there's, there's scales on the spectrum, but there's a destabilization effect that happens when doubt sets in. When you doubt your boss or your company or its mission or its values, that is going to destabilize your drive and your determination to be a great, wonderful, awesome employee and to further those missions and values. When you doubt yourself, which is perhaps the most common kind of doubt, when self-doubt comes into play and you start doubting yourself, it destabilizes you, and it destabilizes other people around you. My point is just this, doubt is a destabilizer. It makes things unstable. When, when, you, when you read the resurrection account, and even the passages about Thomas, it's easy to see that doubt definitely brings a sense of destabilization to everybody and everyone involved because that's what it does and that's why it's dangerous and that's why I'm telling you it's toxic and affects everything it touches. James said this about doubt, James chapter 1 verses 6 through 8. He says, but let him ask in faith without doubting for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind, not stable. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Because that's what doubt does. It creates instability. When this collision happens and you allow doubt to creep in and you allow its toxic effect in your life, it is going to quickly spread and destabilize everything it comes in contact with. I want you to think about another example in Scripture where the Apostle Peter saw Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the storm. You all remember that? It's pretty famous. And he says, Lord, if, if that's you, let me come out to you on the water. And Jesus says, well, put on your big boy pants and come on out here. Let's do it. And, and Peter does, man, to his credit, man of faith. He gets out of the boat and he is walking on the water until what happened? Doubt crept into his life. And the minute, the second, the millisecond doubt started to take place in his life, what happened to the water underneath him? What happened to his life? It became very unstable. It says he began to sink. 
Matthew records it like this in verse 31 of chapter 14. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, because that's where you'll find stability is in Christ, amen? He stabilizes that situation that is very unstable for Peter by catching him. He caught hold of him, and he said to him, listen to the words Jesus said. He said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You see, faith has the ability to bring stability to any situation. Doubt does just the opposite which is why it's so dangerous. It's why it's so toxic. It destabilizes your life. It destabilizes your family. It destabilizes your workplace. It destabilizes your church. It destabilizes whatever you let it get in and touch. It's dangerous. Second reason it's so dangerous is this. That destabilizing effect oftentimes leads to dissatisfaction. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about dissatisfaction and the importance of contentment in a believer's life. It's important that as believers, we're content in who Christ has created us to be and who he's called us to be. And and that contentment is a big part of of how we live our lives and what we focus on. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he's addressing contentment in the area of finances. This is a specific example And he's talking about this ungodly desire to be rich, this this ungodly desire to achieve wealth at all cost. And while this is a specific example, making a specific point with a specific lesson that has finances in it, there's really and truly, there's a lesson here in verse 6 about contentment that can be applied to every area of your life and mine. In verse 6, Paul says this, he says, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. There is not an area in your life or mine that that verse right there doesn't speak to. There's no part of your life, there's no part of my life that cannot benefit from understanding and believing that verse. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. You see, contentment and faith, contentment and faith in God, they walk hand in hand with each other. And in the same way, doubt and dissatisfaction walk hand in hand with each other. You might want to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at a scripture here in this point and another one here in 2 Corinthians 12 in the next point. So we'll be here for a minute if you want to take the time to turn there. But here I want you to look and see what what Paul says. And I want you to notice that Some translations, not the one um, that I read from normally, but some translations actually use the word content. Maybe the one you're reading uses the word content, which is a good translation for this verse, by the way. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12.10. He says, So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now that's a man who's content. That's a man who has understood that godliness with contentment is great gain in his life. Some translations um, use that word content. The English Standard Version, for example, says, For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I am content with weaknesses. How do you be content with those? How do you be content with insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities? How do you get to a place in your life where that is a reality? You see, Paul knew what it was to live in a life of faith and to not give doubt empowerment in his life, to not give doubt the authority to take over any situation or scenario in his life. I mean, don't you think the Apostle Paul had some opportunity to doubt in his journey? To doubt whether anybody was listening? To doubt whether anybody cared? To doubt if God was going to take care of him in the midst of another shipwreck or another beating or another imprisonment? I mean, think about all the areas of, of Paul's life that could have been filled with doubt. And here's a man who's so content And he's walking hand in hand, his contentment and his faith is so strong, it's casting aside all these doubts. 
Paul knew what it was to live in contentment. He actually told the Philippians in Philippians 4, 11 and 12, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned, he says, to be content whatever the circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with a little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. These are not the words of a man who's filled with doubt. These are the words of a man who's filled with faith. You see, when doubts creep into our minds and our lives, they transform and they manifest themselves into all different kinds of dissatisfactions. We become dissatisfied with other people. We become dissatisfied with ourselves. Doubts will manifest into being dissatisfied at a job you used to love. Doubts will manifest themselves in in you being dissatisfied with your children and your kids. Doubt, Doubt will manifest itself in you coming home to a house you were so excited to walk into for the first time 20 years ago, and now it just disgusts you. And you wonder why it's not as big as everybody else's, or it's not as new, or it's not as nice, or whatever else. Doubt will cause you to be dissatisfied with your bank account. Doubt will cause you to be dissatisfied with your entire life, if you're not careful with it. If you give it a foothold, it will bring dissatisfaction to everything. It's why I'm telling you, doubt is toxic, and it's dangerous. And if it's left unattended... If you leave it unchecked, if you just pretend like it's not there, then it'll not only do those two things, but it'll take us to our third one here, and that is it'll lead to disorder in your life. It creates disorder. Because when stuff becomes unstable, and we don't correct it in a timely manner, and we, we let that turn into dissatisfaction, the next thing the devil does is brings about disorder. Disorder will be knocking at your door. An unstable relationship or an unstable marriage that you're dissatisfied in can quickly become dysfunctional. I mean, I'm talking like literally overnight. An an unstable work environment or a work environment that you are dissatisfied in can become chaotic during the course of one meeting. An, an unstable church or a church you're dissatisfied in can become disorganized in the face of extreme disruptions to its mission. I mean, literally in the blink of an eye. We've seen it happen here. See, the devil loves doubt because he can quickly transform it into taking you from a place where you feel a little unstable and just a little off balance or a little dissatisfied into complete disorder and chaos. Again, we we can see the toxic traces of this all through Scripture. And one of those we see is, again, here in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It's in several places, but I've chosen to stay here just in chapter 12 because that's where we were a moment ago. And as we read down a little bit further here in this text, what I want you to know is the real issue here is the people in Corinth had their doubts. They had their doubts about Paul's authenticity, whether he really loved them or not, whether he really had the best in mind for them. They had their doubts about Paul's authority. Who are you to tell us we can't sleep around? Who are you to tell me I can't do that with my dad's wife? Who who, who are you? What's your authority? They had their doubts about Paul's spiritual aptitude for seeing through all the nonsense that he was getting reports of and and to make a judgment on it. So in this one section here in 2 Corinthians 12, 19 through 20, Paul just confronts it. He just addresses it. He, He says, have you been thinking all along that we were defending ourselves to you? No, in the sight of God, we are speaking in Christ and everything, dear friends, is for building you up. This is for your good. He says, for I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want, and you may not find me to be what you want. Perhaps there will be quarreling, jealousy, anger, outbursts, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I fear that when I come, my God will again humiliate me in your presence, and I will grieve for many who sinned before and have not repented of the moral impurity sexual immorality and sensuality they practiced 
You see, some of the reasons this church had descended into such disorder came from a result of their doubts. Once again, we know that that faith produces order and stability, and it produces a solid foundation for us to build on and stand on. But doubt does the opposite of that. It does just the opposite of that. Which is why I tell you, doubt is toxic. And I bet we've all seen this at work in our own lives, how it can bring disorder. And then that disorder goes to destruction or dismantling, if you will. Little by little, that's what doubt does. Little by little, doubt will start to take little bites out of you. And then it takes bigger bites out of you and then bigger bites out of you. And it progresses and it just gets harder and harder to overcome. Doubt, doubt will dismantle your confidence in yourself and others. Doubt will dismantle your trust. Doubt will dismantle your peace. Doubt will dismantle your joy. Doubt will dismantle your relationships. Doubt will dismantle your productivity. Doubt will dismantle your emotional and physical health. It just tears stuff up. It's like this huge wrecking ball that nobody wants to talk about. Because what you have to understand is the end game of doubt is destruction. And if you let it hang around in your life, it's always, always certain to destroy something, and it is going to do its best to destroy everything. Let me say that again. If you let it hang around, it is always going to destroy something, but it is going to do its best to destroy everything. That's that's what it wants to do. That's what the devil wants it to do in your life. He wants it to destroy you. And this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, he, this is where the devil started with Eve in the garden. Oh, yeah, come on, Eve. God didn't say that. Did God really say? <laughs> He's just being dramatic. You're not going to die. Take a, little, take a little bite. Look how good it is. Jesus told us this is who the devil is. He told us in John 10, 10, a thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, dismantle, tear it apart. He says, I've come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. That's what faith is. And the doubter, the devil, he comes into your life to destroy you. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he, uh, it says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. We can see how doubt dismantles. We can see how doubt destroys. We, we've seen how it, he does it to, to people and things in the Bible. Just, just a couple of examples that we hadn't already talked about. I mean, if you think about the, the people of God, the, the Israelites, they come out of Egypt, they finally get there to the river, and the promised land is right on the other side. And they send the spies in. Y'all remember this? They send the spies in, the spies come back, and they've got these, these big honking grapes and all this fruit. And they come back and say, you know what? Place is flowing with milk and honey, just like God said. Only problem is there's some really big people in there. They've got these big fortified cities. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes. I don't think we can take them. And that doubt was so toxic, it spread through the whole camp. And there were only two in the end who said, let's go do it. And everybody else said, nah, we can't do it because of the doubt. You know, God dismantled an entire generation of people and they wandered for 40 years in the desert because of that doubt. When King Saul doubted God, God took him off the throne. God said, you're not going to be the king anymore. I'm going to put my hand on somebody else that I can use to do the work I need to do. There's another one. Zechariah, he, he gets a visit from the angel to tell him about him being the dad of John the Baptist and all this stuff, and he doesn't believe it. He doubts it. You know what God does? God dismantles his tongue, makes him mute for a time because he did not believe. But let's be honest. We don't have to look that far to see the effects of all of this. We can see it in our own lives. We can see it in our own families. We can see it in our own church. We, we, we can see it in our own community. We can see it in the place we work. 
Like we have plenty of our own experience with doubt to understand that it is capable of dismantling and destroying everything it touches. And that's why I'm telling you it's dangerous and it's toxic. So now we all at least have some idea of what we're dealing with here and how toxic this stuff is and the fact that we we need to put an end to it. Why it's so dangerous and, and why we need to stop it, right? So now I want to talk to you about three doubt detoxers. And these are things that, that can work in our lives to get rid of the doubt and give us a firm foundation in faith. And these are three things that work every single time when it comes to doubt. Because they are the, the counter, they are the antidote to the four things we just talked about. And they're really very obvious and very practical when you think about them as well. The first one is this, the Holy Scripture. Anytime you're having a bout with doubt, you need to understand that Scripture has the answer. You need to believe that right from the get-go. That God's Word has the answer for whatever my doubts are about. I was in a meeting with a group of pastors um, back in January. I got invited to this thing. It was a, it was a really cool deal. It was 12 pastors from all over America that get together and talk about different things. And um, I'd never been invited to anything like this before. And at one point in the day, it was a whole day we spent together in prayer and studying scriptures. But at one point, um, we were talking about worry. And we were talking specifically about things we worry about as pastors and how we combat worry in our own lives. And the pastor that was leading this part of the discussion, he started off by, by saying, did y'all know that 90% of the things people worry about never happen? And somebody said, well, how do you know it's 90%? He said, well, there was a scientific study. To that, I piped up and I said, did y'all know that 86% of all statistics are made up and not true? <laughs> and everybody in the room laughed, just like y'all did. Because I was like, how do you study that? I mean, how do you, how do you come up with that? How, do you, how does somebody know what I'm worried about, right? But as our conversation progressed in that time, Something hit me that I had never thought about before, and I'm a late bloomer, I'm slow to the party, y'all have probably already thought about this, but, but I had never thought about this before. And I was sitting there, and I was just praying about it, and thinking about it, and I piped up, and I said this, and everybody agreed with me, because I, I think this is true. I think this is a statistic we can hold on to. When you think about this, I, I think you'll see the, the validity of it. 100% of the time, 100% of the things you're worried about God is in control of. We, we always think about the stuff we're worried about from a different perspective, right? But like the real perspective is that 100% of everything you're worried about right now, 100% of the things you're doubting right now, God is in control of. Think about it. That, that brings a sense of confidence and peace to the situation right there, right then, just because you know God is there. And, and I bring this up because doubt and worry are what we might call kissing cousins, right? Like, we, we understand that, that these two things go together. And we also know, or when we know, that God cares about the things we worry about. And God knows and cares about the things we doubt. And we know that his word speaks to those things. That's when we can move beyond our doubt into a place of faith, knowing that God has already handled whatever we're facing. Like y'all do know God has already seen tomorrow. He's already been there. He's already been there six months down the road, a year down the road. He's already been to where your great, 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 great grandbabies are going to be one day if Jesus doesn't come back. Like God's already been there. So we're able to move beyond this place of doubt into a place of faith Understanding that scripture already speaks to it because we have confidence in it. We're, we're in a better place to process the things of life that produce doubt when we have a firm grasp on and a complete total faith in the holy scripture. And we understand that it's vital and foundational to who we are as a people. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, he said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never pass away. 
They're eternal. This is why I'm always encouraging you, but I want to do it again today. Read God's word every day. Pray God's word over yourself and over your family and over your doubts and over your fears and over everything you can. Pray it over all that stuff. Meditate on God's word. Apply God's word to your life. It's why I'm I'm always saying how proud I am of Philip, our youth pastor, and Hannah, who works with our kids, because they are constantly encouraging our children of this church to read God's word and pray God's word and meditate on God's word and apply God's word to their lives and be in a devotional every day because it's important if you think you have doubts man don't even get me started what your your teenagers are going through they need the holy scripture in their life and we as adults set the example in that when we're reading it ourselves And when we're applying it to our lives, God's word will detox the doubt in your life if you'll read it. The next one is this, the Holy Spirit. So many people underestimate and underappreciate the value of the Holy Spirit in their life. When it comes to defeating doubt, church, the Holy Spirit of the living God inside of you, that is a weapon that never fails. It's just a weapon we don't use very much. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see one of the most amazing verses in in the Bible. And I, I love how Jesus puts the Holy Spirit right at the center of the text. Now, when I read the Bible, I try to always kind of put myself there. I try to really get a sense for how would I have responded if I was there, if I was in that moment. Because the reality is you and I are not that much different from the original disciples. They're just normal people too, right? And in this text, I am 100% certain that some of, if not all of the disciples, probably received this with a bit of fear and trembling. I'm sure it created some questions and some worry in their lives. I'm sure some, somebody probably said, at least in their head, I doubt it. Jesus, he says this in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. He puts the Holy Spirit right at the beginning, right in the middle, that's up front, and then he says, and you, to his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And I bet somebody in the back row was going, I doubt it. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if some of these guys were like, is there somebody behind us? Who, who are you talking to? Uh, us? Because right after this, Jesus leaves and goes to heaven. He just told these guys that are just like you and just like me that they're going to take the gospel to the entire world. Now, I want you to process this for a minute. They don't have a mission agency behind them with a big budget. None of these guys have a radio program filled with faithful supporters to help, help them in this mission. None of them have a podcast or even the internet to use to proclaim the gospel to the world. They don't even have a sending church to support them. They don't have a, have a set of commentaries on their bookshelves. Well, they don't even have an office yet or ever. You know, the reality is they don't even have the Bible, not in the form we have it today. At this point, they don't. And Jesus just told them to go and be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. I can only imagine they were like, what, us? Who are you talking to? Like, like you want us to go without you and do this? Huh, that's a good one, Jesus. You're funny. But right there in the text, before he ever got to that, we find these precious, powerful words in this promise, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. They weren't going alone. My friends, when your world collides with doubt, don't forget about the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. When you remember that the Spirit of God is there and that the Spirit of God cares and that the Spirit of God is going to guide you, that detoxes the doubt pretty quick. Your faith is going to increase and your doubt is going to be destroyed. The Holy Spirit will detox that doubt right out of your life. 
And here's the third and the final one. It's this, the Holy Son. His name is Jesus, by the way, in case you don't know. He's the Holy Son of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is, according to Scripture, the spotless and unblemished Lamb of God. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he removes all doubt. If you don't believe me, ask Thomas. John 20, verses 27 through 28. Then he said to Thomas, Jesus, he said, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. I don't hear any doubt there. All his doubt was gone when he had that encounter with the Holy Son of God. When Jesus is in your life, there's no room for doubt anymore. He destroys it. I want you to consider this about Thomas. Thomas, to the best of my knowledge, never got a book deal. He never became a bestseller. He didn't. He didn't ever make millions of dollars writing books or Bible studies. Thomas never got rich. Thomas never lived a comfortable life. Thomas, from what little we know, went to a place we now today call India. That's what it looks like on the map to us. It says India. And he preached the gospel there. Then he went to China, most likely, probably. We're not real sure about this. But he might have went into parts of China preaching the gospel there. He comes back to India. And he ultimately got his head chopped off. You know why? Preaching the gospel. Listen, you don't let somebody chop your head off for something you don't believe. <laughs> you don't let somebody chop your head off for something you're just pretty sure about. There was no doubt in this dude's mind. His doubts were eradicated. I believe right here on this day when he had this encounter with Jesus, they were totally extinguished because he knew the Holy Son of God, my Lord and my God. And Jesus tells Thomas right after that, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Hmm. That really comes to us, doesn't it? What about you? What about me? What about us? What do you believe? When your life collides with doubt, if you don't have faith in Jesus, you're going to find it impossible to have faith in anything. Because Jesus is the only foundation that you can build anything on and it lasts. Jesus is the only foundation worth building anything on in the first place. So the question is, are you going to leave here today like doubting Thomas, or are you going to leave here today like believing Thomas? Doubt is toxic. But putting your faith in Jesus is transformative. It will absolutely transform you into somebody new. In fact, the Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. And part of that is it pushes out all those doubts. Because with Jesus, there's no reason to doubt. Maybe you're here today and have never given your life to the Lord. You've never believed that he is the one and only Son of God. You've never believed that he died for your sins. You've never believed that he rose from the grave and conquer death for you. If that's you, I pray you would leave here like believing Thomas, not doubting Thomas. And that you would put your faith and your trust in him this hour. Let's pray. I'm not going to ask you to walk an aisle, to raise a hand, to stand up. No funny business, no smoke, no lights. No ten choruses of amazing grace. Just... You and Jesus. If that's you and you want to repent and believe this hour, just say this to the Lord in the stillness of your heart. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would make me new. 
I thank you for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for meeting me here today. Even in the middle of my doubt. Father, as we close this hour, I want to pray for these who've gathered here to worship you because doubt is a real thing we all face. It's not something we can dismiss as fake or false. It's not something we can dismiss as not having any power over our lives because the reality is our enemy uses it all the time. But Lord, I thank you for the reminder from your word of what it is and how it affects us and how we can identify it. And Lord, ultimately, how we can defeat it and detox our lives from it. So for those in the room or those listening right now who are struggling with any form of doubt, Lord, I just pray that you would meet them there in the middle of it and that you would help them take the things we've discussed and detox it right out of them so they can once again feel the freedom that is there in Christ in the form of a doubt-free life, a life defined by faith instead of doubt. Lord, I know you can do it. We know you're willing. So, Father, help us. Meet us where we are and do the work only you can do.